This is Rashonda Thornton, the Dietitian Against Diets. Welcome to my podcast show. Before I start and introduce you to my first guest here, I want to give an acknowledgement to one of the um, partners that I have with me during this particular um, time in a COVID crisis. Prairie Farms, farm owned since 1938. Um, you may have heard of them, you may have seen their products in the stores, but they're known for their high quality dairy products. And during these COVID times, we know that we're all stressed and it's concerned about our health. Well, the farmers and the workers are working hard to make sure that the, the shelves are stocked, <laughs> that you have all the products that you need. It's going to help with your immunity system, help build your body to help through these times. Um, they also are offering coupons right now. If you go to their website at prairiefarms.com, you can also find them on Instagram at Prairie Farms and on Facebook. So go to their website, get some of their coupons, check out some of their recipes, and they actually have some good videos on there that will be educational for you as well. Well, hello everyone. This is Rashonda Thornton, the Dietitian Against Diets podcast show. Um, I have with me today Dr. Lori Punch, and we are going to have we're going to our conversation is going to be centered around what's happening right now as far as the COVID nineteen crisis. It's going to be uh, understanding how this creates infection that leads to um, compromising our immune system and the breakdown of it. And I have. Before and going to do a little bit more of an introductory and introduce you to uh, who Laurie, Dr. Laurie Punch is, and just some of her things she's done um, as a surgeon and what she's doing on a larger scale um, in, in regards to the community. So, um, from what I know, Dr. Laurie Punch, and you, I definitely want to give you the microphone uh, right after this to kind of give a little bit more insight on all the things that you do because I think it's great. Um, she is a trauma surgeon and assistant professor of surgery at WashU. Um, and she um, got her education from University of Maryland, I presume. Um, but she really has encapsulated her education um, in ways that's gearing towards the community where she sits on education, violence, and uh, equ equity in the community. Um, she leads a campaign um, called Stop the Violence, Stop the Bleed, <laughs> Stop the Bleed, which is um, a life, which is an organization built around creating um, life-saving life-saving trauma first aid education and equipment. She was. I also had the pleasure of being uh, amongst her um, last year. Almost been a year. Uh, we both did a TED at talk here in St. Louis. And she had a very moving um, uh, talk conversation, um, and it was called How Bullets Go Deep. So uh, once we get done with this um, particular interview and talk, you got to go and listen to her TED Talk. It's very moving in her perspective as a trauma surgeon. So welcome, Dr. Punch, to the Thank podcast you. show. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, I know Thank that, you very much. Oh, you're, you're so welcome. I know it's been hard to catch you, but I know that you have had, your hands have been dirty, you know, with what's been mm -hmm. going on right now. Um, and before we even get into that, um, you know, I know we all aspire and we're little girls and little boys to, you know, be doctors and lawyers and, you know, you have turned into just that. So like what, you know, what sparked you going in, not just being a doctor, but actually going into this field uh, in regards to trauma and surgery? Um, just what was your path and how did this become a part of just who you are or one of the things about who you are? Well, I tell you what, it wasn't planned. <laughs> oh. I, um, <laughs> I uh, had, um, was born in DC. I grew up in Ohio and I had really no major aspirations for college. Um, but I was an athlete and got recruited to, um, some universities across the country that really opened my mind up to the idea that I could do more. Um, and I could leave my small town and, and, and explore what was possible. I, I always had an interest in science and life and um, really always enjoyed music and people and community and connection and um, ended up uh, at Yale University with no, no plan, no, wow. no idea, just... Um, it was a tremendous time, tremendous time of transformation. And then during that time, I became very aware of the way in which um, mental health was a primary concern in the wellness of our country. That 65% uh, of hospital beds in the, you know, um, 80s were, or early 80s were, you know, taken up by people who were, had mental illness and that, um, 
the social ills presented often as mental illness in ways that were really profound. And I decided that that was the part of life that I would become involved with, but I wasn't sure how. So I took a year after graduating from college and I did three things. I, um, I worked in a lab doing opiate research. I volunteered with a drug recovery program and I uh, worked on campus uh, with a religious organization. And I wasn't sure after, during that time, if I was gonna be a pastor, a social worker, okay. or get a PhD in, in basic science around opiates. And I decided being a physician was the best way to put that worlds, those worlds together of body, mind, and soul. So I went to first considering being a psychiatrist and somehow I came out on the other end of it deciding I wanted to do surgery. Wow. I, you know, I think it has so much of this has to do with a combination of aptitude, like just what you're good at. And I was, a, I'm a handsy person, you know, and um, opportunity, uh, what you see in front of you and need what you know needs to get done. And so uh, that's how I ended up in Baltimore at the University of Maryland. I spent 11 years as part of that institution, both as a trainee and then as a junior faculty member. And I was deeply moved by two things, which is the, the experience of critically ill and injured patients. That Those were the folks that really showed me that for health, but also two mentors in particular, Sharon Henry and Tom Scalia, they took me under their wing and uh, they were the leaders in the trauma center. And I just, I wanted to be them. And so mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's how I ended up. Um, so that's, that's kind of the pathway. Uh, it's the combination of really a long history of wanting to be part of helping people be well and recognizing that what I'm best at is helping people when they're really sick. Wow. Huh. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's the, 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 when you flush it out, it's about helping people and you find your path to do it in your way. And yeah. I think that considering all the other careers that you had looked into, they were all you know, part of the same thread as far as helping people. Mm -hmm. You just found, like I say, where there was a need, where you felt your, your skill set would be in regards to just, and I just think it, obviously it was meant to be so <laughs> that's a really great story and how did you end up in st louis um is that because you moved here for a job and you just kind of yeah felt like i found moved yourself here in the community i moved here uh i i tell the story i moved to ferguson post ferguson and okay. i right um, I, I was recruited um my boss knew me in baltimore we had worked together at the university of maryland he knew me since I was an intern. So he recruited me to join the team. There's actually seven faculty members at WashU in the trauma surgery department who trained or worked at some point in time at shock trauma in Baltimore, where we are from. So it's kind of a family thing. And um, it was tough. It was a tough decision to make to come here. Um, I had at the time a three-year-old son and I was not necessarily super keen on the idea of moving to a place of such unrest, um, especially having especially lived in Baltimore. Place. Yeah. And to living in Baltimore for 11 years and knowing what that life was like. Uh, but what I found when I came here was a discourse, an openness, a community that was ready to talk about some really hard things. And I thought I went from being worried to actually saying, not only am I going to moved to St. Louis, take this job, but I'm going to live in Ferguson. So I actually I live in Ferguson and I am about a mile as the crow flies from where Michael Brown was killed. And wow. I have a beautiful home on two acres that I adore. And I also hear gunshot wounds, gunshots uh, you know, in my backyard frequently. So it's like, it's this mix of, you know, I'm in it and I appreciate it. And I, I respect for the history and I'm learning a lot from it. And I think that was a huge part and all the work, all the work that the region was doing after the riots uh, really opened the door for me to become involved in anti-violence work. 
is that is that where your the campaign kind of created was created or the idea of it or who came up with the campaign for stop the so bleed? that's a great question so interestingly stop the bleed actually was started as a national campaign from the work of a trauma surgeon at the university of connecticut who actually taught me when i was in medical school i went to the medical school with at the university of connecticut and was trained by dr lenward jacobs that um work was was uh driven or inspired by the um, horrors that occurred at Sandy Hook Elementary in 2012, uh, December, when 26 people, including 20 children, lost their lives. Mm -hmm. And the movement that came out of that from the local Connecticut first responders, health professionals, and politicians was to question and to ask what could be done so less people died in mass shootings. And what they came up with was not more hospitals or not faster ambulances, uh, but was to train the public how mm -hmm. to act as first responders, because when someone is bleeding, time is life. There's no time to wait. The first responders can't get there fast enough. And so the same way our country had made the decision for everyone to learn CPR, 50 years, 60 years prior, because CPR was decided, described in the 50s. Um, it took a long time for the, to, to have widespread dissemination, but that's we, we decided too many people died outside of the hospital before they had a chance to get to a medical care and could be revived if somebody could simply breathe for them and pump their heart. We made the decision as a country that we wanted people to be able to respond to life-threatening bleeding. So that's what started the National Stop the Bleed campaign. Now that campaign was focused on mass shootings. It was targeted toward businesses, schools, public spaces. But the truth is mass shootings represent less than 2% of all bullet-related deaths. And so you had this consciousness and this work being done, but it like wasn't being reality. focused yeah, it wasn't being focused on the people at the highest risk for dying from a bullet. And that's actually, the truth is, white men over the age of 50 who end their life by suicide. But the group that comes right after that is black men who die by homicide. And so um, it's wild, right? Like we have this disease process that's caused by a vector and we see what looks really bad. And I'm not trying to diminish, my shootings are awful but they're just such a tiny fraction of what bullets do in our life. So when I moved to St. Louis, it was after Ferguson, there was a lot of discourse around violence and race relations and disparities. And there's just, it was a rich environment to talk about the community's experience of guns. And I took a lot of the experience I had in Baltimore and the consciousness I had about the National Stop the Bleed campaign. And I said, hey, these two things go together. It's fertile and, ground here. Yeah, so I didn't start Stop the Bleed, but I launched okay. Stop the Bleed St. Louis. So and. STB, STL, and the T, no more trauma. This is our logo that represents all the trauma work that we've done that started with Stop the Bleed, but it went way, far, way beyond that. Really focusing on getting this life-saving information and equipment to people at highest risk to die from the particular disease process. Yeah, and how long has, has this been, have you been really growing this in St. Louis? Yeah, so- And they said um, since right after Ferguson, like a couple of years, like how long has this really been, you've been moving? I, you know, I have been doing this work, building relationships, getting engaged into the community for the last four years. And we have in the last two years, taught over 8,000 people in the region how to stop the bleed. Wow. And when I say we, I mean me and the group that started the work. I, I, it started, we had very humble beginnings. It was uh, Jane Hayes, who was at the time a first year medical student and a f former paramedic, as well as Aaron Andrade, who was a surgery resident and a public, had a public health degree. The two of them really helped give me capacity for the ideas around violence prevention that I had. And the three of us uh, founded an organization called Power for STL, which is the nonprofit organization of healthcare professionals who is doing this stop the bleed work, but it's really gone, our mission has gone way beyond simply teaching people stop the bleed. Now we have a center called the T, 
<laughs> where mm -hmm. we do all okay. this anti-violence work, including education, um, creation of trauma first aid kits, youth mentoring, uh, healing arts work, including dance and other types of uh, performance art, because we think that's a huge mechanism for healing trauma and um, other community resources. And that building now, that idea that when a problem in is epidemic in a community, meaning it's inescapable, meaning the entire community lives at a near certain risk of being one or two degrees of separation away from a bullet related event, right? If that's the case, then harm reduction, which is making sure less people die. Is toward that is commonplace. We really need to make sure everybody has the capacity to act. Now, here's the wild thing, the totally wild thing, the unexpected thing was the consequence of showing up to the St. Louis community with this message, hearing people's concerns about their safety and the experience of violence, showing up as health professionals saying, we're not asking you to come to the hospital. We're not actually going to do anything to you. I'm not trying you. What we want you, yes, we want you to find your power to act them. by adding. Well, it's interesting. Now let's break that word down for a second. So what does the word power mean? Power for STL is our name, right? So power, if you look at the physics definition of the word power, power means the ability to do work. So your capacity to do work and work is defined as moving a force over a distance. The truth mm -hmm. is people have capacity to work. People have capacity to move things over a distance. People have power. What they lack is resource and knowledge. So by adding resource and knowledge, we feel like our role is to help people discover the power they already have. And mm -hmm. that has been a really exciting thing to see roll out because what we realized is, you know, we, we kind of started out asking the question, did you know that you could save a life? Do you know how to save someone's life? Do you know what to do? Would you, what would you do? Have you ever been in this situation before? We went from asking those kinds of questions to drumming up this whole other conversation, especially mm -hmm. among our younger folks, which is not, do you know how to save a life? But did you know your life mm -hmm. was worth saving, was worth saving? Yes. Because again, when an event is epidemic, when an event is, is, is just saturated, when it's a foregone conclusion for a young person that their life will end by the age 25 from a bullet, how do you, how do you, how do you move forward? When you've seen yes. people bleed to death in front of you, when you've had family members die, mm -hmm. we're saying, no, 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 no. It doesn't have to be this way. You have the yes. power to act. Great. Love it. So that, that breaks it down and it makes so much sense. And, um, I can only imagine just how far that can go as you guys are continuing to spread that type of language in regards to understanding what powering STL means coming from healthcare professionals. Um, well, it's very it's enlightening amazing. for them. So through the lenses of being a healthcare professional, even at the level where you're on the front line in regards to the trauma component of it, and you've been in the health, in the hospitals during this, these last four to eight weeks, you know, what are your lenses as far as the, you're seeing the, 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 the people that are coming in and that are suffering, but what would you, from that, what do you see as like the underlying conditions as to perhaps why certain populations are a little bit more um, vulnerable to, to this particular virus than others? What do you see as the underlying conditions and factors? So coronavirus is un, not unlike a bullet. And that means it takes advantage of our social connections to spread. So we know that there are a couple of factors in St. Louis that are really going to impact the experience of coronavirus. One, the city is highly segregated. And two, within that segregation, there are concentrations of poverty. So you have a lot of people living in one area of the city 
in that area of the city, there are less resources and there are a whole lot of people who are sharing that risk. So what we're seeing in St. Louis is a much higher pro proportion of the people who get coronavirus are black. And that's not because the as humans, there's a differing risk factor. It's simply the fact that the virus takes advantage of our social structures and the social structures create a very, very different uh, living uh, situation for people in St. Louis divided along racial lines. Uh, then once you have the, the likely, you know, the higher likelihood of getting the disease because the disease is taking advantage of your social system, your social reality, where you live, where you work, where you play, the fact that people have essential jobs and couldn't stay home, the fact that people uh, had shared um, childcare arrangements, the fact that people uh, didn't have the opportunity to do social distancing because just the access to homes and uh, it's just not transportation yep all that stuff so mm -hmm. you have that but then you have you have coronavirus that spreads but then you have covid which is the disease you get from coronavirus infection and covid comes in three forms mild moderate and severe mild will be the case for 80 percent of people moderate will be 15 percent and severe will be five percent and we know that if you have pre-existing medical conditions like heart disease, diabetes, um, that you are higher risk for getting severe COVID and ending up on a ventilator. So the black community in St. Louis ended up getting two significant uh, areas of disparity in the experience of COVID we've already seen so far. Number one, North St. Louis and county, the city and county in North St. Louis uh, and uh, experienced a 1.5 higher rate of infection. Um, well, actually I'm, I'm saying the numbers wrong. It was 1.5 rate of infection for North St. Louis versus a 0.5 rate of infection per 100,000 people for West wow. and South County. So that happened in the beginning. Then on top of that, folks who were African-American had a 2.5 like higher chance of getting the Is infection overall. And then, no, 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 this was just Not getting even. the infection. This was just okay. getting the infection. It wasn't about health and, and conditions. It was about proximity. It was about segregation. It was about concentrated poverty. It was about essential jobs. It was about inability to have access to PPE. It was about all that stuff. But then once people got coronavirus, then you had a higher incidence of severe COVID where now African-Americans were four times as likely to end up on a ventilator due to COVID. So you've got the disease, well, if you got the virus, then you have people getting the virus, then you have mm -hmm. people having a more severe uh, experience of the virus. And all of those checkpoints were, have been places in St. Louis and honestly across the country where vulnerable populations, minoritized populations, disenfranchised populations had higher incidence of the disease. Look at New York City. The highest incidence of coronavirus infection and severe COVID in New York City is the Latinx population. Separate from that, in the country, the Navajo Nation is experiencing the highest rates per mm. person of coronavirus. So this really isn't about someone's race or ethnicity. It's yes. about the experience of health and the disparate experience of health that communities have. And this um, has really, really been, it's been hard to see, but it's also been like totally predictable because, you know, people ask me like, why is it playing out this way? Like, what is it that is causing more black folks in St. Louis to die from COVID? And I'm like, well, nobody asked that question when we're talking about bullets. It's totally obvious to you there. And so it's the same thing. <laughs> the it's same. the same process. Hmm. Now you were saying earlier when you were talking about um, your organization, Power SCL, you uh, had spoken. I think you're getting to um, taking advantage of what's happening now and how can you create, create, create a way to um, get the messaging or get 
some sort of resource yeah. or service out to um, the community that need in regards to the coronavirus? So the whole point, right, of Power for STL is to reduce the impact of violence in the region. And we do that through harm reduction that says this event is going to happen. It's a high concentration of risk in this community. What can we do to prevent that and reduce the impact? And so Stop the Bleed is about having the public trained and equipped to be able to respond to life-threatening bleeding, which can occur after a gunshot wound and other acts of violence. We have taken all of that thought and all of that information and said, what if instead of a bullet, it's a virus? What do people need to reduce the impact and be more likely to survive with coronaviruses everywhere? And so the things we have taught and done for Stop the Bleed, now we've completely shifted to a new campaign, Stop okay. the Virus. So we have five huh. steps in Stop the Virus. Those steps are, number one, um, uh, hygiene. There is no replacement for uh, intense hand hygiene and uh, consciousness of uh, uh, face and uh, mouth touching. Context. And mm -hmm. along with that, the contact and the way that you are interacting with other people. So the first step is consciousness of your space, you know? Be recognizing the power you have, recognizing that the number one way you're going to get coronavirus is to infect yourself by having something on your face and touching your face. The second step is to commit to personal protective equipment. So okay. wearing a mask is a key part of being safe. We know there was all these wacky, messed up, differing levels of advice from the CDC. And the truth is the CDC just wasn't Ready. Giving people, yeah. I mean, they basically changed their advice based on the availability mm -hmm. of the PPE, and that's a tragedy. I mean, it's a yeah, tragedy. Yeah, I noticed it's that. True. So I, you know, had said from the beginning, people need to be wearing masks. I have okay. uh, uh, contacts in China uh, who were going through coronavirus, and they were asking me in January, like, what's your plan? How do you have masks? And I, I took it really seriously. So, um, Okay. That's the second thing. The third thing is to assess yourself for symptoms. Um, you've got to check in every day. Uh, so we know the stand the symptoms we heard about the most in the beginning, fever, cough, shortness of breath. We know those symptoms are very important. But now the CDC has now, are we going to believe the CDC? Or are we not going to believe the CDC? Listen, I'm going to believe this because I've seen it. There are a wide variety of symptoms. That See, that's something that people be, don't know. Right? Yep. So it can be loss of taste and smell that's real, mm -hmm. headache, muscle aches, chills, shaking chills, and diarrhea. Those are all very real signs of coronavirus infection. So you, you, it's scary, right? Like I'll get off a shift it from sounds work like and someone I have been, is have a, It's almost just a sickness, you know? And they're right? typical symptoms from a sickness. Right. And it can seem mild, but I've talked to people who have had it. And they the, the things they've told me about has been like the chest pain is real. The scary. achy, the, and not, you don't get chest pain from the flu, but it's like a burning pain in your mm. chest. The, um, the fever, the fever being really high and staying consistently high. The, some people, the only symptom they had is loss of taste and smell, but it was a lot. It was like profound. And so these are all like really, really serious signs that the virus is present. Now, here's the trippy thing. There's still a huge proportion of people who have zero symptoms, zero, none. They don't have it all. They don't, they don't know at all that they have it. And they can be silent carriers and cause infection mm -hmm. in other people. This is tough. This is really, like, I wish I had, like, this great, like, oh, and this is what you need to do. Now we're finding out that in the young people, age 30 to 40, the first presenting symptom that they can have of coronavirus is a stroke. Because one of the uh, in, impacts of the infection is blood vessel health. So the long story short of all of that is the third step is you got to check your temperature. You got to check in with symptoms and check in with the people around you. Um, the fourth step 
is paying attention to your intake. I think nutrition has a very, very real role in keeping us healthy. It's not the only thing. It's not going to be like, you can't say if you eat lemon juice every day, you won't get COVID. No. <laughs> yes. But it, it matters and it's part of a good plan. I'm giving you a five-step plan. And then the last step is uh, recovery. So COVID is trauma. It is a life-threatening thing that you don't have control over, right? And that trauma causes a trauma response, which is to fight, to run away, or to freeze. And those, those fight or flight responses can be functional or they can be actually ah. toxic, right? And so we've got to bring into consciousness the ways in which that trauma is showing up in our life and, and find ways to recover. Um, so those are the five steps to stop the virus. So hand hygiene and distance, number one. Number two, wear a mask. Number three, uh, check in with uh, symptoms every day. Mm -hmm. Number four, uh, be mindful of your intake. And number five, um, be conscious of the trauma and make a plan for recovery. So um, I'm uh, along with that training and, and, and this, this, this stop the virus campaign, I'm working with uh, prepare STL, the city health department, uh, mm -hmm. BJC okay. and several others uh, to make sure, including my own contributions and the contributions of power for STL to make sure people have access to personal protective gear because much of this you can do on your own, but a lot of it, you just have to have support. Where my heart breaks is for the folks who do not have access to hygiene, a home, and running water and food. Those are the folks for whom basic ability to protect themselves from the infection is, is, is just less. And I think we've yeah. got to work as a region to recognize the vulnerability that people have to this virus and support them as much as we can. Yeah. So um, we're... I'm loving every minute of this conversation. I'm getting sucked in. <laughs> uh, and I know we're coming towards, unfortunately, the end. Uh, and everything you're saying, I mean, these are, these are, these are, some of these things are new. People, people have, you know, no telling, you know, people where they're getting their information um, is very mm -hmm. vital. Um, and mm -hmm. how, who, who is it, come, what's the source of it? And giving us more of like insight on other ways in which the COVID has revealed itself, different levels of COVID and also including the recovery piece behind the five steps. I don't think anyone has ever even looked at it full circle like that. You know, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to, um, you know, what can people, what would be a few things you would recommend for people? Um, let's say they have you know, their uh, personal protection equipment, Let's say they are practicing the social distancing. Uh, when it comes to the, I think one of the, the, those things that people can, hopefully people can acquire and you can acquire that without having levels of education. Some say just do this and do that. When it comes to like the other components, the back end of it, when it comes to like your body and nutrition and your how your body um, can help to fend off some of those symptoms and even the recovery piece, like what would be the, the best place you would guide people or help people to understand really how to um, have more of a better grip on how to manage that part. Cause I really feel like those last four is pretty much, you know, the, the, the way your body, your body itself is going to be able to heal or fight it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'll tell it to you this way. This is not me giving some kind of official medical advice. This is me as a human doing my best to think about how I can, fight COVID. And so I, I think uh, this is the time for people to think about uh, uh, eating real food, mostly plants, with adequate intake of water and, and lots of nutrients that basically support our, our immunity and mm -hmm. don't distract our immune system uh, but instead support it. So what I'll just tell you what I'm choosing to do because I'm taking this all so seriously and because I'm 
exceptional high risk because of the work I do. I mean, I've been right there with people with COVID. And uh, so I, I have chosen to do a plant-based diet, um, which is uh, about now 50% raw. I'm eating foods that are high in citrulline and arginine, which support uh, blood vessel health, including beets, mm -hmm. dark chocolate, leafy greens, garlic, and I throw in red wine. <laughs> That's on the list. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> um, just a little. Uh, I am not eating animal products of any kind because I know that the, the way that that taxes our immune system. And I'm also in, doing intermittent fasting, recognizing that that supports um, it basically, you know, fasting in general is a, if, as long as it's done in a controlled way, supports our immune system. Now, I'm a physician. I have studied this for years. I have read a lot about it and I've done it before. So this is mm -hmm. easier yeah. for me. I have a very, very different starting point and I'm not mm -hmm. trying to say everybody should do this. What I'm saying is how hard is it to make one meal vegan? How hard is it to choose to eat something you made? I mean, people, some folks have more time at home right now. It's a great time to focus on yeah. what you're putting in your body. Uh, choose to drink water or green tea uh, or black mm -hmm. coffee instead of something with a lot of dairy and sugar or processed uh, uh, um, corn syrup in it. Like these are the, and, and I think if we make these small decisions every day, we can move ourselves toward a diet that will support our immune system. Now that doesn't work for everybody exactly the way I described, mm -hmm. but you can't tell me everybody couldn't make one meal richer in plants, um, drink two extra glasses of water a day and be mindful of getting in enough vitamin C. Now that is not going to cure COVID and it's not going to prevent COVID. I yes. really want to make that clear. But yes, it's not if you combine hygiene and distance and personal protective gear and daily screenings and being mindful of the spaces you're in, I think it can be part of a whole plan to stop the virus. I, 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 none of this is perfect, but all of it sums, it adds up. It all adds up. And that's yeah. been my approach to it right now. Personally, it's what I'm doing myself right now. Well, I appreciate that. I can agree with you on many levels, especially that back end. And I can create a list of all the different nutrients and how they contribute to building your immune system, building your T cells, you know, hydration. It's so many different components as to how important giving your body these, these, these raw materials, which is what it's used to using to allow mm -hmm. it to optimize in every level. And no, it doesn't happen overnight, but start bringing that in and making it become your new environment is what's going to give your i call it you know nutrition it's like it's the only weapon you kind of have right now in regards to just your body outside of the protective gear outside of the social distancing yeah. like it's not going to happen overnight but it is definitely going to contribute um as mm -hmm. you're continuing to do this in some way shape or form so i really appreciate yeah. you giving your insight whether you mm -hmm. are Specialist in that or not, you definitely know it from your own personal experience and you know how that plays a role in the bigger scheme of um, the messaging you guys are doing. So as we're closing, uh, I want to make sure that uh, people, are, people are going to hear your message, but I want to make sure that they know where to go uh, find information about your, the campaign, especially now. Uh, where are some places they can perhaps be a part of it or go to some of the trainings? Like, How can people find you or find your organization and be able to um, learn about it. So I have been on Facebook. Uh, so that's Laurie.punch. And you can see a whole bunch of Facebook Live events and posts there. Okay. Uh, I have been uh, posting, you know, I forgot to send you the uh, YouTube channel where all my videos are posted as well. That's the Dr. Punch uh, YouTube channel. Um, I also have a Twitter account, uh, which is Laurie underscore punch an Instagram account, Punchalicious. <laughs> and then <Okay. laughs> that's, yeah, that's a good one. That one's from, from residency anyway. And then another account, uh, our website. So that's www.thetstl.com, the tstl.com. 
And again, I'm partnering with preparestl.com, which is P-R-E-P-A-R-E-S-T-L.com. Um, okay. And, you know, um, there is just one more point I want to make if I can. Real quick, if you don't mind. So one more point is, listen, right now, Missouri is set to start opening around May 4th. And there's going to be different interpretations of that. And maybe St. Louis will do something a little different. And I understand there's an eagerness to get back to things as the way it normally is. There is no going back. We now live as a human race with COVID. It's part of our experience. And I'm worried that people will think that just because we got beyond the peak, that we're safe. We are even more, I think, at risk of the infection once we relax the, re relax the restrictions and go back to life as normal. It won't be normal. And knowing how to stop the virus is going to be even more important once we relax the shelter in place order locally. So I really want to urge people to take these five steps seriously and recognize that just because we are going back to things as they were doesn't mean they actually are as they were. We're living yes. with COVID now and we've got to know how to handle it. Profound words. Thank you, Dr. Punch. Um, everyone out there, please take this message and share it because there is some um, information um, that Dr. Punch is providing that's going to at least give you some of the foundational pieces to help you send this, but also help you to be more aware of like what this can look like as we are slowly transitioning out of this. So take her words to heed, go to her website, learn more about Stop the Virus so you can learn to protect yourself and your family. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Dr. Punch, for being on the show again. Um, and this is Rashonda Thornton, the dietitian against diets, against the diet mentality but all about how to show self-care and self-love. And especially during these times of the COVID-19 crisis, how are you um, expressing self-care and self-love and taking all these precautions? Be safe, have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Well, I hope you enjoyed that show. As we're heading out, I wanna recognize another podcast partner here on the Dietitian Against Diets podcast show. They are a local company here in St. Louis, a local granola company called Banner Roads. Um, Banner Roads is known for its high quality, its um, organic centered you know, ingredients that don't just give you a bunch of sugar and a bunch of uh, dried fruits and a bunch of oatmeal. They are filled with fresh dried fruits that come from different parts of the country. Um, they're, all their uh, ingredients are more centered around nuts and spices um, and all different types of grains. They have a, lot, a variety of unique flavors. Um, they put a lot of pride into their combinations. Why don't you go to their website at bannerrose.com and you will be able to see the varieties of flavors that they have and the different sizes that they have them in. Um, during this COVID season, um, there's a couple more days you can jump in on their um, free delivery if you make any purchases over $25. Uh, if you type in stay strong in all capital letters in a code, you will get your delivery free. So you have family and friends that are at home and really want some not just good granola, but good for you granola, have them go to vanarose.com and order some. Again, hope you guys enjoy your day. Dietitian against diet. See you soon.